Aloha. Okay, welcome to the uh, intro to the post-contact era. Um, and we're going to talk to you all about um, Hawaii's transition from a pre-contact society into post-contact, okay, which is going to be marked by the arrival of Captain Cook. And over here in the picture, you can see uh, a representation of the death of Captain Cook. Okay. So now that you know how the story ends, okay, let's go over okay, a few things. One is which the difference between pre-contact and post-contact, okay? Traditionally, Hawaiian studies is broken up into these uh, time frames. Pre-contact, post-contact, uh, the dividing line being 1778, uh, the arrival of Captain James Cook, and um, who was making his third voyage into the Pacific. So a few bits of information about Captain Cook. Um, there are misconceptions, misnomers, and... Uh, you know, things people didn't realize about uh, Captain Cook. Okay, so let's find out a little bit about um, who he was. Okay, so Captain Cook comes from uh, England, right, the northeast side in a place called York, um, very famous place, a region called Yorkshire. Anybody point it out, or can they see where that is? If not, well, here's a little help. <laughs> okay, York is up there on the northeast side, as I said. Um, New York being its uh, modern um, version of York, right? Uh, New York is derived from uh, the county in England, okay? Uh, although Captain Cook's ships left from the south of England, as all voyaging ships uh, did primarily, uh, Portsmouth and Plymouth primarily, okay? Um, although um, uh, Liverpool up here does have a ship uh, making history, okay? A lot of the ships left from the south, okay? Um, so who was Captain Cook? Let's find out a little bit about him. Born again, as uh, we just saw in Yorkshire, England, he made uh, three Pacific voyages. Okay, so maybe some people, most people don't realize that he actually made uh, <clears throat> three voyages into the Pacific. Okay, a very important point is that he was an explorer, not a colonizer. Okay, um, Captain Cook was not the colonizer. Um, his job was not to go out and stick a flag in a piece of territory and say, I claim this for Mother England, okay? No, he was an explorer, okay? And what he did was he went out and found lands and he found places and he described them, okay? And realistically speaking, for the colonizers to come back later, okay? But his principal job and training was in cartography, which is map making and map reading. And as you can see in the picture, uh, what is he holding? A map, okay? So he went to collect data on plants, animals that were there, um, relatively uh, insufficient data, but on languages, um, observations about people and culture and so on and so forth, okay? But to map these places, okay, to draw pictures for these other explorers to come back and, um, you know, uh, visit them again. So valuable observations. We do have many valuable things that we've learned from the annals and books of Captain Cook. Um, <clears throat> he was not the first European in the Pacific. Uh, the Dutch and so on and so forth, Spanish were sailing around the Pacific. Um, but he was the first European in Hawaii, okay, uh, on record. And <laughs> that's why the asterisk is there. Uh, some people have debated whether the Spanish made it here. Um, uh, scholars have debated uh, that the Chinese were here as well in the 1400s, so on and on and on and on. Um, and there's a wonderful body of literature out there that speaks to all of those things. But for now, and for this lecture, um, let's just stick with 1778 and Captain Cook being the first uh, European arriving in Hawaii and into the post-contact era. So this map is kind of neat. It shows you um, his three, vi his three voyages, kind of color-coded there, which is neat. And for us, it's kind of neat because if you look at first voyage red, second voyage green, third and blue, um, you can see a difference between the second and third voyages, right? First and, first and second were kind of down here, right? New Zealand, Australia, down in the South Pacific, Tahiti's here. And they went back around this way, right? And they basically circumnavigated the globe, right? Start on one side and on the other. This blue voyage is different from the other two in that it starts on one side and goes back the same side. <clears throat> but also in that it, um, Captain Cook is sort of traipsing around up here. Okay, Hawaii's here. Can you guys see where Hawaii is? Um, okay, let's go back to here. Um, he kind of goes up, up into the north over here. And so we got to ask ourselves, what was he doing up there? 
Okay, so this is another way of looking at it. Um, and this is his ship, a rendering of his ship, uh, drawn by Herb Kane. Okay, notice the white sails and the mass, which are going to be important later. Um, so here we go. And here's another detailed uh, look at his voyages. So if you guys can all sort of spot Hawaii here, can you guys find it? Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so notice for me, right, that you have solid lines and then you have a dotted line. Okay, so solid line and a dotted line. So I want you guys to think about why one part of the line is solid and the other part is dotted. Okay, so if you look at the arrows, it becomes important too. Arrows going this way, lands in Hawaii, goes up here, comes back, and then there's a dashed line. Right? Well, the reason for this, and I think anybody that grew up here or has had some in, uh, exposure to Hawaiian history knows that Captain Cook never left Hawaii on his third voyage. Okay, he arrived in Hawaii but never left. Okay, um, so that's why there's a dashed line. His most of his crew went home; he did not. But what was he doing up here? Okay, and this is going to become important. Um, he was looking for the Northwest Passage, and he was up there trying to find all these things. Um, and found landed in Hawaii on his way. Okay, so before we actually uh, move into Captain Cook's arrival, we don't want to just sort of say, "Oh, Captain Cook arrived," but it's really important. Um, in fact, more important to realize or to think about what was the context uh, in which Captain Cook arrived, which is to say, what was going on in Hawaii when he arrived. That's the most important question, okay? Not that when he arrived and who he was, but what was going on that led to his demise? What happened? How did the story play out from him arriving to him dying in Hawaii, okay? And the context was um, <clears throat> war, okay? So what we're going to do is kind of contextualize in the most Hawaiian way possible, which is to show some genealogy and get into a story, okay? So what we see here, uh, as the title says, Mo'oku au hau Hawaii, and this first word here, Mo'oku au hau, is the Hawaiian word for genealogy, okay? So um, this should look familiar, which is our a little rendering of the genealogy of Umi, uh, Umi Ali Loa, right? And so this is actually the genealogy that's going to connect us, you know, for the for the next few uh, portions of our class down until the time of Kamehameha. Okay, so from Umi, from Liloa, Umi a Liloa, down Kiavinuya Umi, is Kamehameha's line. Okay, this is his genealogy. So what we're going to see is that this is this narrative, this Mo'olelo is going to take us right down to the arrival of Captain Cook. Now notice here in red this name, Lono Ika Makahiki. Okay, so Lono, who was our, who was Lono? If you guys remember to the Ho'omana section, Lono was the god, um, right, of peace, right, and um, fertility, all that sort of stuff. Um, Ika Makahiki. So what does Makahiki mean? Okay, uh, Makahiki was um, a time of year when Lono was the god of the land. Okay, for th four months out of the year, Lono was the god. Um, during the rest of the year, Ku, our war god, uh, reigned supreme. And during the time of Lono, which started sometime in November, okay, uh, Ku was put away, Lono was come out. Now this guy here, who was the grandson of uh, the story we read about Umi Ali Loa, right? Lono Ika Makahiki was this historical figure, and he was said to have embodied this god Lono. And he said that he was the return of this Akua Lono in human form. Okay, and Lono, this Lono Ikamakahiki, there were stories told about him, and legends said that when he died and when when Lono goes away, um, at a future time he'll come back. Okay, so people were thinking about Lono Ikamakahiki. Okay, um, and this is going to become important for us. Who was Lono? What was the Makahiki? Okay, um, so don't worry about this next slide and the. Don't worry about the genealogy slides. They're not gonna. I'm not gonna test you on these. But these are just to provide context, because if you notice, um, the boxed names, okay, are ruling ali. Okay, they're the names of our rulers. Um, <clears throat> so, if we look down at this name, Kiave, who for whom uh, Hawaii Island, the Big Island, was named, it's kind of like the the great chief that Hawaii Island was named after, right? 
uh, Moku Keave. Okay, and during this time, during the reign of Keave, um, life was relatively good. Things were at peace. It wasn't until Alapa Inui um, became ruling chief and Kekaulike of Maui, this represents the Maui line down here, um, that war broke out between Maui and Hawaii. Okay, so Maui and Hawaii Island genealogies, Maui and Hawaii Island uh, chiefs were at war. Although, as we can see here, their genealogies were closely tied together. Okay, um, so this becomes very important because when Cook lands, he comes at a time of war. Okay, and this happens for generations, passed down from Alapai to Keawe Opala to Kalaniopu. Okay, who is going to be the ruling ali'i at the time that Captain Cook lands? Okay, so look at this historical flow of genealogy. Cook lands during this time, and Keowa here uh, is the father of Kamehameha. Okay, Kalaniopu, the ruling ali'i, was his uncle. Okay, and Kalaniopu is at war uh, with the Maui line, with Kekaulike Kahekili. Okay, so this is the context in which Captain Cook arrives. He arrives during a time of war.